Hey folks! Live events are becoming can't-miss spectacles, complete with dynamic lighting, video content, special effects, and more, all combining to form endless possibilities. And in 426, DMX-controlled lighting and effects can be pre-visualized right in Unreal Engine. Get a free front row ticket to the future of live event production. Grab the new DMX sample project created in collaboration with multimedia powerhouse Moment Factory. Then go backstage and discover how we put it all together. Ready, set, go to Unreal Build Automotive. Hosted from the Epic Games London Labs, you'll get a sneak peek at the next-gen projects fueling innovation at BMW, Volkswagen, Pagani, and other major automakers in this free virtual event, taking place on March 23rd. Drive over to the event page and register today. SideFX announced that Houdini Engine for UE4 will soon be available for free. The plugin gives commercial artists and studios the ability to widely deploy procedural assets for use in game and XR development, virtual production, and design visualizations, and now without worrying about running out of Houdini Engine licenses. Learn more about Houdini Engine for UE4 at SideFX.com Unreal. Thanks to the ingenuity of former park ranger and geoscientist Blaze LaSala, and a little help from Unreal Engine, you can experience the awe-inspiring caves of U.S. national parks from the comfort of your own home. Head to the Unreal Engine feed to experience these natural wonders for yourself. Want to learn how to create mixed reality experiences for the Microsoft HoloLens 2? In our latest webinar, we cover look development, common UX components, and how to deploy to a HoloLens 2. Watch the complete presentation on the Unreal Engine YouTube channel and quickly create your own enterprise application or AR game. And now for this week's Top Weekly Karma Earners, huge shout outs to Every Nun, Clockwork Ocean, Fatal Break, Luna Nellis, Crew Dimer, E. Lewald, Jay Savage, Hakaishin0895, Kahel18, and John Antonio. Popping over to our community spotlights, Hong Kong indie team Act Plus Studios' first demo for The Legend of Carl is now available. Explore a diabolical world while fighting for justice in the 2.5D hack and slash platformer. Head to the forums to share your feedback with the new team. Next up is a gorgeous automotive cinematic by Damian Belinsky called The Quest. This scene showcases ray tracing tech magnificently. Visit their art station to see loads of incredible auto scenes. Last up, enjoy this outstanding detailed outpost, now taken over by goblins. Stephen Hong created everything in the fully realized scene other than a couple small particle effects and a statue. See more of this beautiful piece on Stephen's ArtStation page. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and my guests today are uh, people, I was going to say, but developers, artists, creatives from the team of On Point Studios. Uh, please welcome Nicholas Bolte, um, head of studio, Kevin Clare, facial animation supervisor, as well as Marion Voller, virtual production supervisor. Welcome to the show. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the awesome virtual production live theater virtual performance um, that you're producing at On Point, On Point Studios. Um, and without further ado, I'm just going to head it over to you, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Victor, for having us. Uh, it's very exciting for us to finally be able to share this publicly, this passion project that we've been working on for quite some time. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for uh, joining us here. Um, what you're about to see is a one minute sneak peek of this virtual theater performance we're working on. Um, please keep in mind, everything you're about to see is being live recorded right at this moment uh, in the studio here in Berlin, Germany. And yeah, without further ado, um, enjoy the show.
Yeah, no luck this time. I'm on my way back to the ship now. It just sucks to come back empty-handed, you know? But you can tell Bob to start cooking because, oh man, am I craving his lasagna. Yeah, so... <laughs> oh, wait a second. I might have something here. Allie, the mission's a bust. Get off planet oh. ASAP. It'll just take a sec. Hey, little guy. Oh, you're fascinating. Okay, so I finally have something. It looks kind of like a caterpillar, but obviously I'm gonna have to get it back to the shuttle. That storm's got us blind. Okay, okay, I'm on my way. Jeez, alley out. Hey there, buddy. Oh man. Okay, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not gonna hurt you. I am gonna grab you though, because. Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Sure. Yeah, no luck this time. I'm on my way back to the ship now. It just sucks to come back empty-handed, you know? I mean, you can tell Bob to start cooking because, oh man, am I craving his lasagna. So, wait a minute. I might actually have something here. Allie, the mission's a bust. Get off planet ASAP. Oh, it'll just take a sec. Hey, little guy. Oh, you're fascinating. Okay, so I finally have something. It looks kind of like a caterpillar, but obviously Allie, I'm going to have to get it. Shuttle. That storm's got us blind. Okay, okay, I'm on my way. Jeez. Alley out. Hmm? Okay. From the top or from here? <laughs> There you go, Nicholas. Sorry about that. Please Perfect. go ahead. No, no worries at all. Uh, as I was saying, the nature of working live. Um, apologies for the small technical hiccup. Uh, that's just the way it goes. We've been rehearsing for days now, and everything worked perfectly. But of course, you know how it is. Um, we're just going to run it again. We do a slight variation to save a bit of time. Uh, keyword now is urgency for Amanda. So she's got to be improvising a bit. Um, hopefully this proves that all of this is uh, happening right now and um, yeah, enjoy our second try. Have fun. Three days of it on this planet. You want to know what it's done every single one of those three days? It's rained. Yeah. Loads of plants, don't see any creatures at all. I don't even know how this is... Wait a second. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh my god, I think I've actually found something. Get off planet ASAP. Oh, I'm sorry. Now you're in a rush to get me off this planet? Not two days ago when I said there was nothing here and now they're actually... Never mind. It's fine. Because I found you. Yeah. Okay, come on. All right. 
Oh, you're gorgeous. Ellie, head back to the shuttle. That storm's got us blind. Okay, fine. I'm on my way. All right. I'm out. Yeah, you don't have to deal with him. He kind of sucks. But also, don't worry about the lab I'm taking you to. It's a really nice lab, I promise. Time to go, buddy. That's super cool. Thank you all for showing us that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, maybe Amanda, you want to uh, come in real quick and uh, give a little chat. Please a little, give applause for the, credit? for the actress. <laughs> Amazing job, despite the circumstances. Yeah. Um, as you can see, uh, this whole workflow is um, not really 100% uh, safe, but that's also what makes it very exciting for us. Um, hopefully, the second improvised version, you know, was kind of able to show how easy it is to adapt and overcome. Uh, you know, if you have to save time, okay, we just do another take and uh, speed it up a little. Um, I would like to take it from here and take you a bit through, well, um, the whole uh, product as a whole. I mean, what we're trying to achieve with it and what we're doing exactly. And yeah, get a bit more technical after that. So. Sounds good. You're good to go. Floor is yours, Nicholas. Awesome. Thank you. So um, what, is, what is this cargo thing we've been working on? Um, basically, it's a virtual production showcase. Uh, the main drive for us to work on it was to take these techniques and workflows that we work on for different client projects and put it into one concise thing that we can use to, um, you know, to, to work and improve on these methods. Basically, it's a live stream five minute CG short story that, uh, you know, that we use to, to promote our skills and um, our knowledge. We have the fully performance captured protagonist. So we have face, finger and body capture all uh, at the same time. We stream that into the Unreal Engine and basically treat the captured person like a game character. So there's colliders, there's uh, you know, dynamic events. I'm going to go into that a little bit later, but that's basically the idea. Um, what we want to do with it um, is not necessarily uh, establish a new medium or something like that. It's more for us, um, as I said, a, a vehicle to drive, um, you know, progress and to explore new ways of creating content, to, to make it possible for creatives on set to be immersed in their own... Um, words that they crafted and to be able to produce content in this um, in this way. Um, not all the workflows and things we come up with for this demo are going to apply to, you know, every project. But yeah, we just hope to, to we think we just scratch the surface with all this live streaming and, and uh, engine, um, game engine style stuff. And yeah, we just um, keep pushing. Right. The full performance will be online later this year. Uh, we're super busy right now, so it's a bit hard for us to tell when exactly that's going to happen. But I want to give you like a little bit of the story so you can have a better idea of what you just saw. So yeah, story is a, a, a space science fiction-y horror um, short movie. Ellie is uh, our main protagonist, is a space zoologist. Kevin really likes that term who's uh, on a mission in space to basically catalog and collect all possible aliens. They all get stored on one space station, and I guess most people can guess where this is going. Basically, Jurassic Park in space, um, and we went for this premise and for this very simple to understand concept because we knew from the get-go it's going to be very short. We want people to, you know, start watching it in the middle of it and still roughly understand what's going on. So that's totally by design. And I think that's about it for this presentation. So next, I want to bring up um, a bit of stuff from the past. I need to leave the live mode for this to a old, older project. So what you're seeing here is our CES demo. 
this was called the cave and was basically the first step on this journey. Uh, we had the situation that we had people in Las Vegas promoting basically um, Nexa, the main company we are a part of. And we were asked to do uh, like a little showcase ourselves. So we were eager to create something really cool. And uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, let me just really quickly start up the scene. Yeah, so basically we use the OptiTrack plugin for this to stream the character into the engine. And we use these really cool assets from the asset store uh, that you know uh, every anybody can get really to fill their their word with content um, to come up with this little demo. And while we were building this, you know, usually it was about being able to remote stream the data to Las Vegas from Berlin, which is a cool thing, and meant we had to stay up very late. But it was also here where we realized, okay, this is a really cool opportunity to play around. Um, with the in-game mechanics of stuff. So all I did, sorry, uh, I, I get the game sound, it's very loud. Um, hope you guys don't hear it. Uh, all I did is put a collider on the foot of the uh, knight and basically have the environment react to that. So yeah, this is a concept we call the virtual stage, basically an interactive stage, which means that tracked objects or tracked people cause events in the um, environment. Right, uh, we have a little uh, guest showing up at this point. Okay. All right, but who wants to know how that ends, right? Um, anyway, uh, this was basically the first step um, towards the showcase. And yeah, I'm going to show a few. I, I can't even call it technical details because it's not that deep technical. But yeah, just some of the stuff I, I brought up. Nicholas, what was the software that's um, getting all the motion capture data? A very good point, sorry. Um, this is OptiTrack Motive. Um, I meant to talk about that too, uh, but I can also uh, address it now. So as you guys can see, hopefully we have a 36 camera OptiTrack setup here in Berlin, uh, like a seven times nine meters of volume, which is medium sized. Um, the good thing about the architecture in here, which kind of forces us to, to um, you know, to adhere to these ranges, is that we have pretty, pretty stable and pretty precise tracking going on, which is something that enables us to, um, you know, to do these live setups in in general. Um, also, huge shout out to the OptiTrack support team because during the CES uh, last year we were running into some real difficulties. Um, these kind of connections that I just showed, they are usually designed for, you know, local machines or network exchange of data, but we use it through a VPN. And obviously that was not, um, you know, it took some help from the OptiTrack team, which they uh, provided and, and they really saved us there. So big, big thank you uh, to, to the team. Right, and um, so much for that, um, right. I was about to get into the um, setup of my night real quick. Um, super simple, just to really drive that point home. Basically has a collider on his foot, right? Um, the whole character has a tag. And when I open the scene, whoop, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Cool. Um, you can see that there's like a collider object waiting for exactly that collision to happen. And then it would just start an event in my event manager. This is usually how I do these things. I just have one blueprint that kind of manages all these things that are supposed to happen, um, which is tricky sometimes if you use streaming levels because of the referencing. But yeah, that's pretty much all there is. It's really, really simple. I mean, it was the first thing <laughs> we did, to be fair. Um, yeah, and this is the kind of, of stuff um, we started with. Also, the colliders on the hand, I used that to to have some finger animations. Uh, we didn't have our fancy gloves back then, but Kevin is going to talk about that more later. Um, basically, when he grabs a sword or the torch, I think that's even in here. Yeah, well, it's exact same way I'm doing it, right? So really no rocket science. Um, yeah, that was a really cool project. Uh, 
also great is that um, we could ship that build and have it like started in VR or not. So each um, guest in Vegas could, you know, choose what kind of uh, performance or, or demonstration they prefer. And we didn't have too much trouble with, with doing different builds and stuff like that. Cool. Um, let me check if I wanted to show something else here. Um, no, that, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much it for this one, I think. So yeah, um, really cool to be able, you know, um, to, to use these assets from the market store. Also, uh, when we have clients who want to do Unreal projects, a lot of the time it's just really easy to, to get something going that works for them. And yeah, it's just great to have this opportunity and, and, you know, these amazing artworks at your disposal as somebody who can fill it with, uh, with performance. Right. So I'm not going to close this just in case I need it later. And I'm just going to keep talking, <laughs> uh, about the, um, the scene you just saw. So a number of things going on here. Marion will talk a bit about the camera and the environment later. Um, I wanted to talk about technical stuff. For example, um, events and how we handle them usually. Uh, this is also not very complicated. Basically, there's two kind of things that can happen, or two kind of triggers, I should say, that can cause events in the world. The first one is an input event. So that means we press a button on a gamepad or a keyboard or using the fancy new API. Um, the other way it's triggered is by the actor or a prop colliding with something, right? So we have input events and triggered events. And yeah, a good example for the input event is the caterpillar uh, wake up in the beginning. Uh, this is actually probably not going to work, but you know, to have it wake up, that's a button input. You can also change its color based on what values you put in and stuff. So it's just really cool to have um, this opportunity to um, mix these gameplay style, you know, scripts with actual performances. Um, right, sounds in general usually are input events if they're not bound to like a specific dynamic event we trigger. Uh, a really cool dynamic event I'm a bit proud of, to be honest, is, uh, is the footsteps. Um, I'm still working on this, so it's not, uh, you know, what it can be, but, um, yeah, that's obviously a huge problem. When we did our very first demos, we had people like tipping the buttons to try and match uh, the people's steps. So we needed a solution there. And a very simplistic approach I used for this is to have two colliders on the foot to basically try and catch when the foot is really solidly planted. A lot of people are you know, going to think, what are you doing? There's probably a million better ways of doing it. That's my way. Uh, and it works kind of kind of okay so far. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to use more sophisticated systems for the actual showcase where we will hopefully be able to have um, amount of rotation in the bones to use uh, Foley audio, you know, because that's what really drives it when people interact and stuff. So this is one of many things I'm looking to improve on um, for the final showcase. Right, other than that, um, yeah, she can open a visor dynamically. Uh, <laughs> works sometimes it works better than other times let's say uh yeah and we have a, quite a lot of stuff going on with her actually there's a focus target actor on her that helps the camera you know to get the right focus no matter how far she's away um so we don't need to, to do manual focus pulling if it's uh, avoidable and yeah in general there's a lot going on here um i also wanted to quickly point out um, her animation blueprint. I mean, <laughs> not sure if I can show this. Um, there's a lot going on here. We have the AR kit uh, workflow mixed with the Live Link from Motion Builder workflow. Um, maybe I can show this real quick. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it takes me a second. That's okay. There you are. Just want to let chat know that um, 
Kevin and Marianne will be diving into the technology used for the face and uh, so, some more of the motion capture um, right after Nicholas. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So, yeah, um, I'm just going to bring this over real quick. So just maybe to say a word about how we stream the motion data directly into the engine. There are several ways of doing it. And currently, I'm leaning more towards the LiveLink um, way of doing it. The reason being um, really retargeting uh, quality. So, right, if I put this in, we should already be able to see that in the, yep, in the animation blueprint. Um, yeah, and this kind of connection is just fantastic. It's it's uh, really cool for us. It's uh, great for content. Um, clean up you know uh when i do like promo material for this whole thing i just really play the scene in motion builder while i edit it and see it live in engine so there's really no better way as an animator i feel to to see where you're going <laughs> with something um and in general um this whole lifelink workflow uh, gives us a lot of options yeah that's the visor that's pretty easy and honestly i'm not even sure what this does. Okay. <laughs> um, but to maybe finish on this whole um, motion capture streaming um, topic, we basically have two workflows. I already talked about the motion builder lifelink one. What's great about that one is with the human IK, you always get a pretty solid um, retargeting. You have IK options, which in our case is super important. You know, we need the hand of the actress and the hand of the um, um, character to be at the same place so she can accurately interact with other tracked things or persons um and also you know uh you have just a, a ton of, of fine tuning options and roll bones and stuff the contra of the motion meter lifelink um the con of the motion meter lifelink workflow is that it's always retargeted to a specific character so that takes time right every time you want to drive except you're using the same character with the same hierarchy um, it takes time to set it up properly, but you get the better quality. While on the other hand, the OptiTrack plugin work, uh, workflow directly from the from Motive, what we used uh, with the CES demo, I feel this one is great to do scene scouting. Uh, it's great that you you only need to press one button and you get unlabeled markers directly into the engine. Uh, so that is really helpful if we are trying to find distances between several things. You can just you know, do it that way. It's super helpful. And also, since the bone remapping is not character specific, you can animate any character with uh, anybody in the volume pretty pretty quickly. So yeah, OptiTrack plugin I feel is is great for uh, getting something to run fast and you know for scouting. And you can certainly make it work better. Uh, I, I you know, but uh, the Motion Builder Live Link one, especially for me, somebody who's done a lot of editing in Motion Builder as well. Uh, that's where I feel like I have more control. Right. But in the future, we are actually hoping to go a different route and focusing more on the control rig and its ability to interact with incoming motion capture data. So, yeah, this is ideally where we want to take it. We want to um, just leave this running so it's not completely standstill. Um, yeah, we want to get to a point where the control rig is just taking the incoming animation data, retargeting it for us, and we can then, in a perfect world, just use the take recorder to record any performance and then edit it in engine. Um, that would be dream come true. And uh, we're working towards uh, finding these workflows and um, yeah, setting everything up to, to be able to work this way in the future. Cool. I think um, that's mostly it for me. Uh, from the, for now, I just hand it over to Kevin, aka the good looking Max Payne. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And um, yeah, talk to you later. Thanks a lot, Nicholas. Okay, hi. So yeah, I'm Kevin. I'm a facial capture specialist here at On Point Studios. Um, I'm in charge of our facial capture pipeline as well as our finger tracking pipeline. Um, but generally, because we're such a small team, we all have to wear a lot of hats. So 
I work quite often as a producer. I'm quite often in the in the suit, in the volume, dancing for testing purposes and for other reasons, and just because it's fun. Um, but yeah, uh, so to get down to it, um, traditionally with our facial capture pipeline, we would run, uh, we use faceware. Um, this is for when we're using, uh, when we're recording the data for later pro uh, processing. Um, generally, uh, it's uh, the tools that they give you are really good for uh, batching and editing, reworking a large amount of uh, facial animation. But uh, we found that uh, with the live performances, it's uh, much better to switch to the iPhone AR kit workflow. Uh, we found that the, the, the balance between getting good tracking data and um, uh, performance uh, really goes along that line. So um, for us, it's more important to be um, performant than looking, you know, a, f a few missed shapes in the face, like if she doesn't capture a nice smile or something like that, as the uh, as the performer would, that's not so bad as like missing frames or stutter or if the face just explodes at some point because the tracking gets lost. This is the thing that we want to avoid as much as possible. And with the iPhone, not only do you have you know this, you can you know very quickly if you point the camera at someone else's face it's calibrated automatically and you know that's for us it's going to be super important um actually in a future project where we're going to be using the same headset and passing from person to person there's going to be no calibration or anything so um for us this this is uh, the reason why we've gone down here um of course uh tracking doesn't really you know your tracking can be as good as possible um but if you haven't got a face rig that is calibrated to actually capture all that decent tracking data, um, it's still not gonna look amazing. And uh, luckily, um, like uh, six months ago or so, uh, we managed, uh, we got in contact with a company called ISCO. Uh, big shout out to these guys. Um, they, um, they provided us with some test rigs and we um, managed to find that the rig works perfectly with AR kit. It just, you know, plug, you plug it in and automatically all the blend shapes are just working perfectly with, again, with the iPhone, you can pass it around and someone's automatically popping her face. It's, it's a really, really nice rig. Um, and they were kind enough to produce the, the, uh, the face rig that we use for Ali, our main character. And again, they, they, they hit that wonderful balance between uh, quality and performance with, you know, more performance being the, the thing that we're after. Because live performance, that's the thing that really sells it. If, if there's no hitching, if there's no stutter, that's the thing that can really break the, the performance, really. Um, but on that note, um, I might want to just quickly say that uh, we're currently using uh, this headset, which uh, you guys might be a bit familiar with. Uh, normally it's white. I spray painted it black because uh, it was reflecting uh, with all the cameras and stuff. But um, unfortunately, the, the fancy bit that uh, hold, held the iPhone broke. And so I'm currently holding it together with hair bands. So you can see that we we run a really nice ship here. You know, it's super hot, top quality stuff. Um, my shout out to the whole community at large would be if you could suggest a decent headset that we can that we can use, I would be eternally grateful. Something that holds in the uh, the iPhone and ideally has a counterweight because this iPhone at the front is like constant weight on the the head. And the poor actress, she's, you know, she's been sitting in it for a few hours now while rehearsing. We did do a lot of rehearsal today. Um, it's, you know, it hurts her neck and stuff like that. So for, for her sake, please give us some suggestions. And if you could post that in the forums, that would be amazing. Um, okay, my last thing was uh, the Stretch Sense gloves, which are these things here. I uh, can't really see because I'm wearing black. My chair is black and they are black, of course. 
very gothic. Um, so uh, we got a uh, a message from StretchSense about uh, a year and a half ago. Um, a big shout out to Shin from StretchSense because uh, she sent us a you know wanted to know if we were interested in a test run, and then she flew all the way from New Zealand to give give us a test run, which to me just blows my mind. And um, we were really impressed with the gloves, and you know we we got a, we got a pair straight away, uh, which we were super happy about. And um, ever since then, we've been you know really impressed with the um, the quality of finger tracking that we get. Um, Soon we'll actually be getting their new gloves, um, their Super Splay gloves, which uh, we can't wait to get our hands on. I don't apologize for the pun at all. Finger tracking, hand glove. Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I need a drum kit or something, you know, boom, boom. Um, but the great thing about these guys is basically their customer support. These guys have been absolutely amazing. They, um, because they're over in New Zealand, you know, if we've ever had any problems, um, they've had to stay up, uh, you know, stupidly late for uh, for them. They're staying up nine o'clock in the evening, ten o'clock in the evening. We're waking up with a coffee, and they're like red-eyed and drinking Red Bull. Um, but they've always been super friendly uh, to deal with. So a big shout out to the Strength Sense teams. Uh, hopefully they're uh, hopefully they're watching. Hi to New Zealand. Hi guys. Uh, you guys are awesome. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's a quick overview of the peripherals that we use for the um, for all of our projects. And now I'm going to pass over to our my wonderful colleague Marion here. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. Okay, so um, I am the last one. Uh, the guys were talking so uh, much. Uh, they say a lot of things, so um, there's, so there are not so much things left. I will talk a bit about the teaser and how it came to it. Um, yeah, first we had just the idea of having a simple teaser because of we uh, wanted to, um, as we were producing, as we still producing the full thing, um, we thought on. Um, it takes a lot of time and we have to have a vertical slice of it to getting people interested. Um, but yeah, um, so it should be simple because if we wanted to uh, spend all the work on the full film or on the teaser, so we came up with a, um, just a black room, door opens, um, and to the light rays, uh, you see uh, Ellie coming in um, and holding the container. So um, that was the idea, but yeah, I thought maybe we can push that a bit more. Um, and I was just, um, it was just a weekend and I was browsing through the asset store and um, I found some really nice assets for it. And you all know how this ends um, at the end of the weekend. Uh, we had the set for the teaser. Um, on Monday, I uh, showed this to the team, and even Niklas could not really say no. Yeah, I was I was actually a bit mad at him because we were like, uh, "Yo, we have uh, client projects and all this stuff going on." We were like, "Yeah, I'm doing a simple teaser, just door opening. She comes out, and that's it. You know, just to show the body tracking and live stuff." And I come back on Monday and just see a living organic planet. Uh, it's like, yeah, I thought we could show her collect uh, the caterpillar that she has for the rest of the story. Like, great. Now we kind of have to do it. Thanks, Marian, for making it <laughs> uh, again really hard. But I think it was well worth it. I'm really happy we went that way. Absolutely. I don't think um, anybody had watched just the uh, Black Room. But in the end, um... Yeah, we are here now. Um, so, um, camera work. Uh, for the camera, for the teaser, we just decided on having uh, a VCAM and just some small movements. Um, and here we wanted to show the, uh, the whole thing from the creature's perspective. Um, in the main showcase, that's absolutely different because of we, uh, we built the set more um, in the game way. 
So uh, the full set exists and Ellie is discovering it bit by bit. Um, and here we, um, we can have it easy <laughs> and we, have, we can have it hard and we decided to build a hard way. Um, so we uh, want to have a one taker. Um, so the teaser, um, we have a very small set, uh, but for the main showcase, the camera uh, moves through the entire spaceship. Um, in order to make that possible, um, with the size of our volume, um, we need some decent techniques, some smoke and mirror techniques, you know, um, for film and theaters. Um, but I think uh, about these technique, the techniques, we uh, talk then in uh, detail if the whole showcase is uh, coming out, uh, was released. Yeah, I can say that. Um, some last words about the capabilities of that work workflows. Um, if you have the full environment um, and all the all our tools are set up, um, it's totally easy to um, take the environment and make some playthroughs. Just uh, um, the um, director and an actor or a stand-in. Um, you can go to the um, to the whole scene, and you can feel the scene. Um, I remember from an early stage of the story, where we wanted to have a shock effect, um, and we just uh, put up the scene here, um, and just we're standing in the volume and watching the the scene through the uh, VCAM, and we saw the dark floor, um, um, and at the end there was a door, and just that uh, was enough to uh, giving us ideas to uh, really um, setting the spark inside the 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 uh, brain of the act uh, of the of the director, and we came up with a really really good and scary effect. So um, just thinking of um, just with just a storyboard um, and just rough ideas of the environment. Um, it's a lot. It's really a lot harder to come up with uh, some ideas of the story, or um, even to to pitch those ideas. If you if you're directly standing on stage and it's you have the full environment around you, um, it's it's really easy to to think of um, things that could happen in that stage in that environment. Yeah, it's um, it's it's really it's a perfect fit for. Um, for previews of movies and um, game cutscenes. So, um, yeah, if you're thinking of game cutscenes, maybe. Um, I think, yeah, <laughs> uh, that was it. Um, I think, yeah, I will um, give over to Nicholas again. For me, I have, uh, think, uh, I've th said it all, I think. What I wanted to say. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Marian. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm not the big talker. No worries. Uh, cool. All right. Thank you. Um, I think this kind of rounds up our first kind of look at the Soul Project. Um, maybe just to reiterate some of the points. Um, and what what specifically what Marian said is I think uh, really important. This idea of being able to create a virtual set relatively easily, um, even if it's just a white box and two mannequin performing in it, it just helps you to block out scenes really quickly to get you know get the creativity going. And once you actually put assets in there, have the ambience audio in there, and all that stuff, also for the talent. It's just a completely different experience. Um, at least, you know, for some projects, it definitely, I think, makes sense. Uh, Marian brought up game projects. We actually had a few clients now that we were able to, you know, stream the data live um, to their location into their engine, basically, with the plugin we built. So this is, I think, a cool way to go about for remote shoots as well. Um, and yeah, we're just... Um, Really excited to to be able to share this whole thing. Super interested to see what people are thinking and uh, uh, especially what they think we can improve on. 
as I think I said earlier, we're obviously looking to improve in all areas of this thing. This is really just um, the start for us with this project. And yeah, if, uh, oh, one thing I really, really need to mention is um, the credits for all the art that we um, got to make this happen will definitely be on our website at a later point. Um, it's really important to me to to give out the links and everything for people to to be able to find these amazing pieces. Uh, big shout out to all the artists. Uh, stuff is amazing, and um, yeah, we we'll, we we'll post all of it on our website and in the final video. And I think for now that's it. Cool. Are you all ready for a couple of questions? Sure. All right. Start from the top. Um... Joe Judge for GP Instructor asked, "What kind of what kind of play space do you recommend for a starting out space?" Starting out space for um, mocap, basically, I suppose. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, really depends, I guess, on the system and on what you want to do. Um, obviously, you know, you would think the bigger the better, but then if you're working with an optical system, of course, it's going to get pretty expensive very soon. You know, there's there's different options to go. There's suits that are probably for beginners uh, a reasonable um, alternative to an optic system. There's video-based solutions that are getting better and better, which are also, from a hardware perspective at least, cheaper. Um, but, you know, um, I think, you know, the, the kind of volume size we have with 7 times 9 meters, if it's smaller than that, you have a hard time recording a lot of stuff uh, like runs and and you know multi performer action so generally speaking uh, make it as big as you can <laughs> and good luck finding a place with a, a 5 meter ceiling <laughs> that leads into uh, our next question from uh, Rachel Tyrell um they asked can you direct the actor live and how many actors can you have in the scene should i answer Okay. Um, yes, we can direct the actor live, um, and we can have up to five people in the scene. Uh, but this is not what we have planned for cargo. Uh, for cargo, it's going to be a maximum of uh, two actors at the same time, which is tricky enough to have them interact uh, live and you know not blow out the um, the rigs too too much. So yeah, that's one of the main challenges actually to make that work in the final. Uh, Showcase. The next question comes from um, Danger Dex. They're asking, uh, we're saying, very impressive work, everyone. My question is, it looks like you may have cheated a number of things by having action take place off camera, especially involving the Caterpillar. Do you think that the use of fixed cameras is necessary for achieving high fidelity productions as you're demoing here? And then follow up is, how much do you rely on an assumption of a particular viewpoint when designing a production from a UX as well as a cost perspective? Cool. Uh, <laughs> Freiwillige? Uh, yeah. Um, so regarding the camera angle, OK, lots, lots of things to address here. So did we cheat a bit? Yes, of course. Like um, the Caterpillar, I think you know everybody who played a game uh, at some point in his life, you know, notice these little tricks. Ah, the tricky part. Uh, you know, let's uh, look somewhere else for a second. We try to avoid this, of course, and we try to not shy away from the from the more tricky bits. But in this case, you know, since it's just supposed to be a teaser and it was supposed not to be too much work, which it absolutely <laughs> ended up being, um, yeah, we we tricked a little here and there. Um, the steady camera is definitely not necessary. This is. A pretty crazy case because the cameraman is actually like end size and you know when it was tracked the whole time as well marion was uh, handling it while we were shooting and in the main showcase as marion was already saying we are looking to have a one shot um camera following the protagonist throughout the ship which is obviously hard to do because there are several rooms but we only have one volume so uh, yeah, that's what Marin was referring to. We have to uh, get creative. And I think I forgot what the last part of the question was. Um, the que the follow-up was, I guess they were asking a little bit about the uh, 
cost perspective around that as well. And I think that relates a little bit to sort of the size of your volume, right? I mean, you could go ahead and, and I guess have a capture volume for each room, you know, that's taking place in the production. Um, but that gets really expensive really fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you want to talk about that, Marian? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we you 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 can have uh, as you said you can have a capture volume uh, for every room, but I think it's not one hundred percent necessary because of um, you um, in not every case you want to have a one taker, you know, um, and uh, one one taker that's that's really um, the biggest problem for that um if you thinking on cuts um yeah it's it's not a problem to restage uh the people um in an cut so um then th this is uh absolutely absolutely lowering the, the the costs because of yeah you can you can have the the smaller volume and so on i think that's um that's maybe answering this, uh, the, this question yeah, I think it's, so, and it's, I think it's it's, 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 to, it's totally uh, it's all about uh, what he wanted to to uh, tell. It's it's about the story and about how to how you wanted to tell the story. Um, and in in every movie, it's like this. Um, if I want to have practicals, if I uh, if I show if there is an action, or if I do it off screen, that uh, uh, decision in every every movie happens. That that decision. So and yes, you can, uh, yeah, you, you you can have a, a scene for much less ma money if you uh, show something uh, if you don't show something. And I just wanted to double down, Nicholas. You briefly mentioned, but the the virtual camera is actually tracked in real time and was operated by Marion, right? Yep. Yes, that's correct. Right, and um, maybe to yeah to follow up on this uh, too real quick. Uh, because I think the cost point is, is very important and it's totally yeah, right to, to wonder about that. Obviously, to prepare all this stuff takes huge amounts of time, right? I mean, we are a very small team. We set this up with three guys. So obviously, it would take more, a, a bigger team that already has established workflows much shorter time. So we're hoping to do the main thing in mm -hmm. a uh, way faster. But um, we believe that this... this um, this pre-production work is worth it because okay. you kind of save it then in the end. You know, you have this um, increase in, in pre-production. You really have to spend the time, block out all the scenes, know exactly what kind of events are going to happen and stuff. But everybody is aligned and they know what's happening. And in the end, in the post, it's hopefully just down to editing animation, you know, make it that extra smooth and, and clean out the little mistakes. And um, this is the kind of way we're, we're pushing for with this project. Moving on, um, me straight asked, did you use any photogrammetry software for this project? No. Kevin? <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the character that we got was uh, an asset from the store. Um, we had uh, ISCO, um, they took the scan that we got from a company in UK, I think it was, um, we found this character that we really liked. Or we sent them the scan, and they rigged it all for us with all the blend shapes and all that stuff. Um, so no photogrammetry. But we do do photogrammetry here. We have a sister company called 3D, you know, 3D, uh, 3D Instagraph, sorry. Uh, and we do have a photogrammetry scanner that we have available. Let's see, moving on. Um, John Corbett asked, is the motion capture oh, is the motion captured actor using a marked path in the room um, that is coordinated with your script, uh, and do they have a director telling them when to advance? Um, in this case, um, we didn't mark anything because uh, it's pretty easy for her to to kind of navigate the set. Uh, we have. Um, 
yeah, set up like a, a small frame so she knows where the cave entry is. We also have a little caterpillar lying around there. That's uh, kind of a, a eye a target, you know, that she uh, focuses on. And yes, but for the main showcase, definitely, because we have, let me think, we have three areas in total and each of them basically get a color. And we, <laughs> yeah, there he is. Uh, each of them basically get a color. So the act, Amanda just needs to remember which level she's on, basically, because we're using elevators. One of the easier ways to get different rooms without leaving the volume. Um, yeah, so you answer your question exactly. That's how we do it. And yeah, sorry, I already forget, <laughs> forgot the second part of the question again. Uh, the second part was just if there was a director um, directing them sort of when to advance and when to... Yeah, uh, that's something we are still working on. So with three people, now we're four, luckily. We got a, a backup uh, with Orku now, who's also working to um, merge all the stuff we're doing with the API and um, the web remote, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, you guys remote control. Talking about. Yes, yeah. exactly. And uh, yeah, that's obviously going to push things even more because the client is, you know, it's way easier for him to handle all these events he wants to trigger on a tablet, for example, than, you know, using an Xbox controller. Um, yeah, and we have a director on set usually. We have an operator who's taking care of the input events. Um, Marion is doing a few things on his camera, for example, the focus and, um, yeah, just switching from camera to camera if that's happening. So, yeah, generally we have like a camera operator, an event operator, and a director who's more just taking care of the direct uh, creative process. Uh, creatively, like it's all three of our babies. Uh, so generally, when we finish a take or something like that, we'll have a quick huddle and discuss it with it between ourselves. Like, you know, what do you think of that? Do you think it was good? Do you can do that? Or oh, can we do this this way? Um, but because we've been working together for such a long time, we generally have the the same opinion, and uh, then we sort of like tell the 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 actress uh, who's she's a pro, uh, she's really good, and um, yeah, and also we've been rehearsing this for six months or so. So, you know, on and off because, you know, we've had other projects to work on. But yeah, so for this thing specifically, we're all kind of the director, which again, you know, we're all wearing lots of hats. <laughs> uh, BA03030 asked, um, what would an actual use case for something like this be? Is it really? For live performing, or is it, or is this rather something that can be part of a production process for games or movies? All of this, yes. Um, yeah, um, the idea would be to kind of, you know, uh, what I was trying to to get across earlier is, uh, it's not about this particular package we're building. It's more we're building something, and then the tools we use to take to to build that, you can take and apply into other projects, right? Some people might really like the, you know, the high, um, the interactive events, for example. Cool, you can take just that part and apply it to your project. You don't need to go through all the other necessary steps. Um, yeah, it's definitely useful for games, I feel, like, especially if you wanna, um, you know, do cutscenes and you just have everybody, um, you know, being their character they're portraying and in this in an environment we use, uh, beamers and, and big screens so everybody can get a good idea obviously sometime in the future we hopefully be able to use AR for this would be even sicker um, and yeah this is you know just just pushing all the limits and the main use case for the particular mix we're doing right now is actually virtual theater I'd say it's uh, doing a performance that's full CG get the tracking to work good enough that it works live and um, yeah, be able to reach your audience um, through this new channel um, that you know is streaming. Awesome. Um, Danger Dex had another question. How do you design around clipping, specifically when dealing with characters' hands and fingers interacting with objects in the world? Yeah, uh, uh, rehearsing. <laughs> rehearsing. Lots of rehearsing. <laughs> There are ways that you could build a um, a physics asset and, and, and have collision on them and, and other means of using inverse kinematics as well. Um, but with fingers, that can get 
complicated really fast and you're also not getting the exact results you know that you're receiving from the motion capture um data yeah totally no there's definitely clever ways of doing it um i have to admit that's something we didn't prioritize so far um we try in a lot of ways we try to design the whole thing around the constraints we have here but yeah uh, definitely something i look forward to with the uh, you know the control rig hopefully as a real time solver on the horizon that would be perfect one of the perfect use cases for it to actually accommodate for these things and uh make it even more believable question let's see next question comes from night night monkey folkways um they were wondering they were also wondering a little bit about the art and the 3d models and 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 the maps uh, I guess in general the question is how much was created in house versus purchased on the um, the asset store. Um, pretty much everything is from the asset store. Uh, like we, the three of us are not artists. Um, I mean, you know, the two of them kind of are, but uh, you know, <laughs> not the kind of artists um, that you would need to to create this super high detailed um, game assets. So yeah, all of it is from the store. Um, and all of it, you know, uh, is, is great content, uh, and we're really grateful for for being able to use it this way and implement it into the project that easily, you know, which also these kind of things were really used to be really time consuming, and now these days it's just so easy to look for something you like and uh, you know use it for your project. There was uh, no the, yeah, just the the last thing was the the face was not was something that we did buy by the a external vendor. That's the one thing that was uh, not from the Epic Store. There was a note earlier um, about the uh, the scene that Nicholas you're currently showing that it would make for a beautiful wallpaper. What? Yeah, uh, this one. noted. Oh, cool. Noted. We'll. Um... We'll have mm -hmm. some screenshots available as wallpapers. Uh, I think we actually have this exact, like the kind of exact uh, framing going with the caterpillar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we're really happy if you like it. Um, I think the credit here goes to Marion for uh, great lighting and uh, great use of weather effects and and everything. Um, yeah, just goes to show how how much how much you can build um, with a small team. Absolutely. Honey Go no, ahead. Ready. No. All good. Um, <laughs> Honey Bumblebee 79 asked, is it possible to buy a cargo session, like coming to your studio and play the character, get, a record, get it recorded for home, <laughs> or even better, for greetings or gifts? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we have to think about that. Um, uh, We're all working for money. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean... Sure, I don't see why not. Um, feel free to get in touch. Uh, in general, you know, we would be grateful for any kind of ideas, feedback, criticism, especially um, if if people could would leave that in in the Unreal uh, announcement forum post. Uh, that would really help us out. Um, I'm also trying to reply there as, as fast as I can. And um, yeah, absolutely. Let's get in touch. Uh, schedule something if you're interested. Why not? Yeah, uh, one one thing may, maybe to to add to this, um, cargo is uh, just it's, it's just a showcase. So um, uh, we uh, we just showed what what what's able uh, to uh, develop for us in that short time. Um, but it's it's just the basic basic thing, um, and we we really wanted to have directors coming here with their own artwork, with their own ideas, and using our tools. That 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 is the idea from uh, of cargo, and uh, yeah, you can buy a cargo session or you can come over with your movie and doing a cargo thing, right? Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the the thing is like we're the theater. Uh, you guys uh, can come and fill the stage with your own story ideas, right? Ideas, exactly. We're just a stage and, and, and the cameras. <laughs> yes, an artwork. Yes. Yeah, there were a few more comments in line with that if it's possible to get their own avatar into cargo and um what's really cool is <laughs> <laughs> if you're able to retarget so i think with control rig you could actually replace the um the character you know even after it all has been recorded right so there are a lot of opportunities there to sort of customize um and and once you've once you've captured that and saved it in sequencer you can then share that project and anyone else can actually 
um, replace the characters or the props or anything else that they would like to. Hundred percent. Yeah, there's so much, so much potential here, and this is also what I meant with uh, autosave. Fit me again. Uh, <laughs> it's also the potent, like what I was referring to when I said we're really just scratching the surface. You know, nothing of this stuff is like groundbreaking. It's really just combining all of this in a in a in a way that empowers creatives and um, devs to get stuff done hopefully faster and hopefully with a lot more immersion and a lot more, you know, uh, eyes on the target, basically. Yeah, one thing about the whole you know, avatar creation, you know, it's the elephant in this room is the uh, once the metahumans gets released and, you know, we can get it working with our system, that's something that we definitely want to play around with. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I think everyone is fairly excited about getting their hands on the creator. Um, few more general questions. Um, I think something that I was curious about as well, uh, and I saw a few questions in regards to input from the actors and actresses. Um, how, how did you do the, um, the head visor? Oh, you don't want to know. That's like the cheapest trick in the book. It's like she literally has a sphere looking out of her head, and there's another sphere on her finger. And, you know, on Enter, uh, on Collider Enter, you um it opens and you know i have a small fail check so it doesn't like de 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 all the time but i saw today how i um <laughs> i'm i'm ashamed because i saw today that i actually use a lerp to lerp between both states of the visor when i could just have used an animation clip and play it back and forth you know that's stuff uh, you learn when you look at these uh, projects that you worked on a while ago um I would do it differently today, but yeah, it's, it's, I generally, because I'm a fairly simple guy, I try to use the simplest solution possible. And um, yeah, luckily with the Unreal Blueprints, you know, even somebody like me who's not like an experienced coder or something, you can get amazing results really quickly. With such a solution, you're reducing the amount of hardware needed, though. If that's the case, then that was totally by design, of course. <laughs> of course, just. Something to take into consideration. I think that was it um, when it comes to questions. Uh, there's, there's more questions in regards to um, sort of how, how can people, you know, get to work with you guys. Um, and so uh, I think we'll point to your website and there's a contact, um, contact info on your website, right? We pasted yeah. that in chat. Uh, you can also find it on the forum announcement post on the Unreal Engine forums, uh, which is where we initially announce all of the live streams that we do on the uh, uh, Twitch and our YouTube channel. Um, I did want to go ahead and mention to chat as well that if you're interested in getting started with this kind of virtual production work, but you don't have the budget to invest in a large, you know, optical motion um, motion capture space, uh, you can get started by just using, you know, v uh, VR hardware um, since they basically fill the same role um, at a much much lower cost. Um, and if you're interested in that, I actually did a live stream in 2019 on how you can get started um, using sequencer and animation blueprints. It's called Indie Motion Capture. You can find it on um, in the Inside Unreal playlist as well as our yeah, it's on our YouTube channel. And if you really want to go back and see chat, you can you can scroll back in the Twitch um, Twitch directory from all of our videos uh, that went live here. Um, before we uh, wrap wrap this up, was there anything else that y'all wanted to leave chat with today? Um... Uh, yes, I guess I would really use this opportunity to uh, to do another big thank you. If that's not too uh, too annoying, I just really quickly want to thank all our partners for supporting us with this. The Nexa family, our friends at Friday, and of course uh, Epic Games uh, and you, Victor, for having us on. Uh, it's been a huge honor, and we uh, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we had like a, a slight setback with the first uh, uh, presentation, but you know that's just uh, the nature of doing it live. And yeah, we're looking forward to to show the rest of the whole thing uh, later this year. And with that, um, I think it's worth mentioning that our plan is to actually host the entire uh, showcase sometime later this year on the channel. Yes, I mean, if you would have us, we would be. Honored. I would love to. Yeah, I, I think I think we'd we'd love to see that. Um, th that would be great. 
So with that, we will follow up sometime later this year. Um, we, we will see when, but uh, keep keep an eye out on our Twitter channel as well as the uh, Unreal Engine forums for more news in regards to that. Um, thank you all so much. And thanks to Amanda um, for sticking with the, uh, the, the helmet as well as the iPhone and the suit. I've been in one. I know it can get a little bit sweaty. It can get a little yeah. bit uncomfortable. Try to sit down and you have a bunch of balls <laughs> all over your, uh, uh, your suit. Um, it can get a little bit tricky. So thank you all for coming on today. Uh, before we leave, I just want to go ahead and mention that uh, if, you, if you're streaming on Twitch and you'd like to watch and uh, consume Unreal Engine content, make sure that you follow um, or look for the Unreal Engine tag that exists on Twitch. Um, you can also look for the game development tag. And those two combined, you can filter out and find people, others who are live streaming Unreal Engine content on Twitch. Um, we also have a page for um, our meetup groups. Uh, which you can find at communities.unrealengine.com. Clearly, no in-person meetups are currently happening during the pandemic, but you can go. Some of them have organized virtual meetups, um, and if you don't even have a meetup group close to you, um, you know you can probably shimmy your way in and find another virtual one that you can go ahead and uh, participate in. Uh, if there is no meetup group near you and you're interested in starting one and potentially hosting these meetups once the pandemic is over, or even just start one right now. Um, and then host virtual meetups, you can go ahead and fill out a form also at communities.unreligion.com. Uh, it says become a leader, uh, and we'll go ahead and get in touch with you. Um, make sure that you submit us all of the projects and also things that you're working on. We keep a close eye on all of our channels, but you can always add us on the forums or Twitter. Um, there's a work in progress section. There's a release section. You can also find that on our community, uh, unofficial community discord, Unreal Slackers. You can find that on realslackers.org. Uh, great space, and they are now over 50,000 members. Uh, which is a, a great place to have real-time conversations. Um, for anything... Um... <laughs> huh. Apologize, my dog is getting a little antsy. Um, here he comes, wants to say hi uh, to the world. Um, I lost my train of thought there because I had a, a dog start barking in my ears. <laughs> Make sure you follow us on social media for all news on Unreal Engine uh, and as well as Twitch. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that notification bell so that you can see when we go live. Um, and with that said, I want to thank you all again so much for coming on. Uh, thanks to Amanda and everyone else on your team for making, uh, making this possible and for us to be able to consume it in real time. It's super exciting. Um, hoping to see you all back again later this year. I think everyone's looking forward looking to that. Forward to uh, yeah. yeah. There, I will. I will say there were a couple of requests. Like, can you please show show it again? Uh, is there anywhere where people can go and actually watch um, a segment of the teaser? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's great that you mentioned it. So we will put a video version of this online. Um, this will have the old, like, a character face that we used previously. So that's about the only change uh, compared to what we showed today. Um, yeah, this will be available on our website. It's onpointstudios.com slash cargo. But uh, I shall also post it again in the uh, Unreal Announce uh, forum post. And yeah, um, hey, we are super happy to do other live shows, I think. I'm not sure I have to ask Amanda, actually, how she feels. Um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> great. We, we've put a lot of work into this teaser. And if we can show it again, and people are interested to see other slight variations of it. Uh, there's a certain version of the uh, teaser that exists that uh, unfortunately we weren't able to uh, to go through today. But um, yeah, we think of something, we keep you guys posted. And yeah, again, thank you very much for taking the time to check us out. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, next week, we have Sebastian Lowes and some members of the simulation and training team from Epic coming to talk to us about uh, simulation and training. So make sure you tune in for that. And with that said, it's time to wave goodbye. It's been awesome having you all here today. Um, I hope everyone out there stays safe um, and continues to uh, be excited about the future of Unreal Engine. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>